And I want to thank uh, Jonathan uh, Bautista for playing uh, for us this morning. Uh, welcome to uh, this time uh, of worship and gathering, um, especially if you are Presbyterian. Uh, we're glad you are here um, to be with us and uh, a group of moderators, vice moderators and co-moderators, those of us that have had the privilege and the honor of serving you in the moderator's office. We are grateful that you are here with us today. Um, this is a unique gathering. Uh, we're glad you're here from wherever you are. We're thrilled that we could um, use this space and use some technology in a way to be able to gather uh, us together. Um, I do want to thank again uh, moderators, vice moderators, co-moderators for being in the space and then for uh, staff and leadership from Presby the Presbyterian Church in Palo Alto from First Press, where I serve as their pastor, uh, for offering your gifts and time here today. Um, just a few things I want to remind you as you are joining us, if this is the first time with us or um, I can't imagine it's the first time at a webinar, but if it is, um, we had, did have every intention of having this be a meeting and being able to see faces, and, um, and we had this great kind of liturgy we we're going to do. Uh, but um, our service, First Presbyterian Church uh, Palo Alto service last night, got Zoom bombed, and we felt like we couldn't take the chance. So last night we pivoted to a webinar, and so it's much more one unidirectional than we would we usually do and would hope to have had today. But it is still a, a holy space, and so we encourage you to go ahead and put questions in the Q and A. We're we're figuring that part out, but you can see those, and we're gonna we're trying to figure out how to moderate that a little bit. Um, this will still be recorded and posted on YouTube and Instagram TV. So um, just know that uh, we will have this uh, for folks who are not able to be here. Uh, please know that uh, this will be recorded and we'll share that out um, pretty quickly today. Uh, the service is very simple today. You don't need a bulletin. There's nothing that you're going to need. Um, we will guide you through this time. And, and then the best part about these services is uh, you can sing like no one can hear you because uh, unless you have other people or animals in the space with you, they can't. Uh, and so I find myself actually singing more and louder and more bold uh, during these uh, remote services. So I encourage you to stay. Um, you'll We're not going to be able to hear you anyway, but um, sing like no one can hear you because we can't. Uh, again, feel free to put in the Q&A your prayers, um, any words as the Spirit moves you. We'll use that as kind of our space um, to be able to see what each other are saying. Um, and then we are we have a tech deacon that's trying to monitor um, what's going on, and we're, we're figuring out all of that. Again, we pivoted to a webinar uh, late last night, so uh, um, grace abounds as we go. We begin, though, uh, as uh, we do here at First Presbyterian Church uh, every Sunday, with uh, just a moment of silence, a moment to um, reflect and to center ourselves. The world is filled with chaos around us. There are moments of beauty, but a whole lot of suffering, a whole lot of pain, and we're all holding that probably more than we could have ever imagined before. So uh, we begin with uh, simply a time of silence. We don't play any music behind it. Um, it's for two reasons. One, just to center yourself, to be ready for this space, and to acknowledge that the land that wherever we are, for most of us, this is not land that um, was come by honestly, that this land was taken from our indigenous siblings and the land was dishonored. And so we acknowledge that. Um, there's a number at the bottom of, of this slide that you can text your zip code to. It'll tell you if you don't know um, uh, who's, what indigenous people are on that land before, it will tell you that. But I'm going to ring a chime, and then we'll just take two minutes. And two minutes can feel excruciatingly long if you're somebody like me, but it is not that long. And so I encourage you to listen to your breath, ground yourself, to just center and acknowledge the land that you sit upon now. So... Let's take two minutes of silence to center ourselves.
I now invite you to join in our litany. Uh, you're obviously um, still muted and we will not be able to hear you, but I would encourage you and invite you to join with me as I read the bold section and each of the uh, moderator, vice moderators and co-moderators will uh, take a section at the beginning. So please join in our litany, were you there? Were you there when they crucified our Lord? Yes, I was there. We were there. We are still there. Were you there when people were discovered? Land was taken. Those same people were massacred. That same land defiled. Yes, I was there. We were there. We are still there. I'd invite you, Brother Fahed. Were, were you there when bodies were stolen, enslaved, dehumanized, and traumatized for generations? Yes, I was there. We were there. We are still there. Were you there when families were torn apart, children kept in cages? and contempt fed to those starving for new life. Yes, I was there. We were there. We are still there. Were you there when our government incited war for political gain or stood idly by in the face of human suffering? Yes, I was there. We were there. We are still there. Were you there where gunshots rang out and grief swept over family after family after family and still we did nothing? Yes, I was there. We were there. We are still there. Were you there when we chose safety? self-preservation and hate over courage, justice, and love? Were you there when they crucified our Lord? Yes, I was there when they crucified the stranger. Yes, we were there when they crucified our neighbor. Yes, we are still here when they crucify our Lord. Amen. afraid little flock because your heavenly parent delights in giving you the kingdom sell your possessions and give to those in need make for yourself wallets that don't wear out a treasure in heaven that never runs out no thief comes near there and no moth destroys where your treasure is there your heart will be too southern trees 
bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves, blood at the root, black body swinging in the southern breeze, oh, there's strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. My apologies to Andrew Day, whose haunting rendition of that classic by Billy Holiday was as riveting and as phenomenal as the original by the great Billy Holiday. Ancestor James Halcombe reminds us that there is a connection between the lynching tree and the cross the lynching tree. Lynching was used as a tool of terror in the wake of the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, amendments that were aimed at granting black Americans full rights and citizenship. There were a group of white people, mainly white men, who were determined to make sure that those rights would never come to fruition. Uh, so they went on a campaign of terror in this country using lynching as a tool to keep black Americans in their place. Uh, the inimitable Ida B. Wells led an anti-lynching crusade in the 1890s, one that took her to the lawn of the White House and into direct confrontation with President McKinley to impress upon him to take action uh, to do something about the lynching that was taking place in America. There is a direct connection between the lynching tree and the cross. Although the lynching tree is a symbol of white power and black death, Dr. Cohn argues, and I agree, that uh, the cross is a symbol of divine power and black life. I like how Pastor Otis Moss puts it. Uh, Pastor Moss uh, says that they nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. They pierced him in the side. They put a crown of thorns on his head, but they messed up. I say again, beloved, they nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. They pierced him in the side and they put a crown of thorns on his head, but they messed up. Why do you say that, preacher? They messed up because they didn't nail his mouth shut. And because Jesus could still speak, speak even while being tortured, even while being persecuted, Jesus kept on preaching while being persecuted and teaching while being tortured. He spoke these powerful words from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The cross, crucifixion was, uh, was a, a tool, it was a method of capital punishment invented by the Phoenicians but perfected by the Romans. And, and here we have this itinerant preacher from Galilee, this, this preacher who all, all he did with all of his life was go about doing good, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, making the lame to walk, proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. And, and yet, because he was deemed a threat to the established order, he was deemed a threat to the way things were, he was deemed a, a threat to a status quo of, of domination and oppression. He was convicted in a kangaroo court on charges of sedition and insurrection. And here we have him. Uh, hanging on the cross, that 30-pound that cross beam that he had to carry himself up the Via Dolorosa. Uh, we, we find him hanging on the cross, passing in and out of consciousness, even as the swelling begins to cover the nails in his, in his hands and his, his feet, even as he tries to push himself up to relieve the pressure on his feet and then pull himself down to relieve uh, the pressure uh, on, on his arms. We, we, we see Jesus even as he's being tortured. He speaks words of life. Speaks words of life 
from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What is this forgiveness business all about? Well, I think the first, first and foremost, forgiveness is about maintaining focus on the Father. That, that in spite of the empire, uh, having sentenced him to death, in spite of them claiming authority over his body and his being. Jesus, I believe, is saying that yes, you may break my body, but you will not and have not broken my spirit. That forgiveness allows us to, to affirm that God is still God, even while we are going through torture, even while we're being tormented. Forgiveness enables us to say God is God and God alone. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus maintains his focus on God in spite of the torture, in spite of the tragedy, in spite of what he is going through at the moment. Jesus demonstrates in a very profound way the power of forgiveness to stay focused on God even when your tormentors are right at your feet. But another thing I think that is suggested by this seen at the cross is that Jesus not only reflects on who God is, but Jesus also remembers who he is. As you see, when we, when we forgive, when we summon the power of forgiveness, we remember who we are and whose we are. But not only does it help us to remember who we are and whose we are, it helps us to remember even who our tormentors and torturers are. Even in the midst of being tormented and tortured, we can, we can see that any human being is more than their worst act. Even while they are tormenting and torturing Jesus, Jesus has so much God about him that he can see that they are more than just that. Oh, I tell you, there's power in forgiveness. That, that forgiveness allows us not to freeze people in the moment, but to free them up to new possibilities, even though they are at their worst. Forgiveness calls us to reflect on who God is. For forgiveness helps us to remember who we are. And lastly, forgiveness helps us to release, to release the pain, to release the anger, to release the resentment. Forgiveness frees us from all that would beset us, from all that would dehumanize us. Forgiveness helps us to move from an I-it relationship, as Martin Buber, Buber would remind us, to an I-thou relationship. It helps us not to not to commodify and to objectify our tormentors even as they have objectified and commodified us. Forgiveness calls forth that old song of the black church. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down. Friends don't treat me like they used to. Since I laid my burden down, friends don't treat me like they used to. Since I laid my burden down, and my favorite verse is, I'm going home to live with Jesus. Since I laid my burden down, I'm going home to live with Jesus. Since I laid my burden down. Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen.
criminals hanging next to Jesus insulted him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Responding, the other criminal spoke harshly to him. Don't you fear God, seeing that you've also been sentenced to die? We are rightly condemned, for we are receiving the appropriate sentence for what we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. He wasn't innocent. Jesus had spent the years of his ministry centering the marginalized and hearing the voices and pain of the oppressed. He healed the sick so that they would no longer be invisible to passerbys or even their own families. He challenged religious leaders not for intellectual prowess, but because their traditions had become static, sacrificing a life of community for hollow rituals. And he invited people to follow him, the only requirement that they bring all that they are to heed the call heard deep in their being. He took the margins and expanded the courageous spaces so that everyone found themselves inside. So to the empire, Jesus hung on the cross because he was absolutely guilty. His words and actions embraced an abundance of love for others, becoming so much of a threat to Rome and even the religious leaders who conspired together that he had to be executed. His body intended to be a witness to the status quo required for life under the state. Don't step out of line. Don't stand out and your life will be protected. But even as his body was tortured and twisted on the execution cross, Jesus still embodied his ministry. The criminal to one side, wrapped up in the jeering of the crowd, sarcastically taunts Jesus while asking for their lives. It's a skeptical last stitch effort for relief from the pain. But it's the criminal on the other side of Jesus who first acknowledges their rightful places on the cross. And he states that Christ had been accused wrongly and asked for mercy when he would breathe his last. I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. Abundant words of love once again spoken by Christ. In the midst of the powerful witness of empire declaring blasphemy and treason through criminalized bodies on the cross, Jesus speaks words of hope and love. He declares that the pain of the world's justice system would not keep even this convicted man from the joyful freedom of paradise. The distinctions of right and wrong, just and unjust, punishment and righteousness are as upside down today as they were in Jesus's time. We watch the news and see the disproportionate amount of black and brown bodies beaten, brutalized, and whispering their own last words while gasping for their final breath. And the justice system grasps onto the pattern, often producing verdicts that feed into the pain and fear of communities of color across the country. This week alone, testimonies in the trial of Derek Chauvin required witnesses to relive the trauma of watching George Floyd's life crushed and their inability to do anything about it. And I think about this as an Asian American woman standing in the shadow of six women murdered in Atlanta that look just like me and the people that I love. A reminder that we are exotified and perpetually foreigners in the place that we call home. In the midst of my sadness, anger, and uncertainty, I've been cracked open to reveal my own story with deep vulnerability so that others hear the pain 
of the Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander community. The system asks far too much of the exact people who are hurt by its brokenness. And this is as much inside of the church as it is outside of its walls. It's often the marginalized, the oppressed, and the vulnerable who must give of themselves, shouting from the streets and rooftops that the community we were meant to be is distorted. People of faith need to get, engage in the world in a way that, in spite of the twisted priorities and justifications of the power and principalities, we embody a fuller expression of love. As Christ followers, can we imagine lives that are so radically full of love and compassion that we would risk our own comfort, even our own safety, for a different way forward? Can we fathom choosing over and over and over again the needs of the least of these rather than obediently living under laws and regulations based on prejudices and rooted in power? Can we take up our own crosses, trusting that paradise is promised to those who approach the world with just as much, if not more, concern for others as they have for themselves? I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. Friends, we need to live as if we know that that is true. It's time to become guilty in the deep yearnings of this world so that we are complicit in the kingdom building that Christ ignited thousands of years ago. May it be so. mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Let me share with you uh, three lessons. Lesson number one, that we are Easter people. Lesson two, that the crucifixion was the Roman method to kill people. Lesson number three, love one another. Lesson number one, that we are Easter people. Every year we come to Lent, Holy Week, Good Friday and Easter, my childhood memory comes alive. As a Palestinian, Christian, Arab child, I always looked for Easter and not for Christmas. This is the time we had new clothes, great food, and great celebration. Later, I discovered that we are really more biblical than our sisters and brothers in the USA 
and Euro. Why? There is no mention of Christmas in the book of Acts, no mention of Christmas in early uh, church uh, history. The big deal was Easter. To join the church, be baptized. In fact, every Sunday was a celebration of Easter. My question to all of us, can the church reclaim, recapture the power of Easter in the life of the church? When Christmas comes, we get ready. September, October, November, December. When Easter comes, nobody feels it. Even the culture doesn't know we exist. Lesson two, the crucifixion was a method for the Roman Empire to torture people and kill them alive. For everyone to see them and get afraid. During COVID-19, this is the best time to teach our children, our youth, and our members that the early church was a persecuted church. They did their worship in house churches and not in big buildings or cathedrals. Lesson number three, love one another. Jesus said to his mother, woman, this is your son. Then he said to the disciple, this is your mother. We do not have time to go to the emotional trauma that was going on in Mary, seeing her son being tortured, in pain, in agony, dying on the cross. Through this encounter, Jesus was putting his words and his teaching into action and practice. What do I mean? Last night during the Last Supper, he said, I give you a new commandment, love one another. Today, Jesus is establishing a new order, a new covenant, and a new commandment, love one another. Let us face it, Jesus did not follow his Jewish custom or tradition if he was doing that, he would have said to John, will you please take my mother to our relatives in Bethlehem, just six miles south of Jerusalem? Or when you have time, take her to Nazareth of Galilee uh, to our other relatives. No, he did not follow his customs and tradition. He entrusted his mother with his disciple John and the new community. Yes, the people of the way, the body of Christ, the hospitable people, yes, the new Christians. What an amazing action to follow Jesus and discover the power and love of Jesus and this new community. During COVID-19, the Holy Spirit is already Filling the church to discover the love of Jesus again. The question to all of us, will you be willing to discover Jesus again? Will you be willing to discover Jesus' love again? Will you be willing to love one another again? Will you be willing to love our community and our world again? Last June, I received a call and Martha said, my husband Bill died and I want you to do the funeral. I said to her, the protocol, you call your minister and your minister will call me and we do it uh, together. She said, for the last year, nobody visited Bill. Imagine after he retired as a medical doctor, he was church every Sunday, ushering, welcoming people to the church. The last year of his life, nobody called him or visited him. What is the message? Is there a way for our ministers, 
our elders, our deacons and members to say, I'm going to do four things a year, to call, email, text every member at least once a quarter. I do not think as Christians right now, a small percentage of your be and go to church, a small percentage, less than half of people go in the United States. We in the church need to have two messages, how to love Jesus, how to follow him, number one, and two, how do we care for one another and the world in a prophetic word of justice and love in Jesus name, amen. Have you left me all alone? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my anguished groans? My God, I cry out during the day, but you don't answer. Even at nighttime, I don't stop. You are the Holy One, enthroned. You are Israel's praise. Our ancestors trusted you. They trusted you and you rescued them. They cried out to you and they were saved. They trusted you and they weren't ashamed. Indeed, all the earth's powerful will worship God. All who are descending to the dust will kneel before God. My being also lives for God. Future descendants will serve God. Generations will come to be told about my God. They will proclaim God's righteousness to those not yet born, telling them what God has done. Dios mío, Dios mío, ¿por qué me has abandonado? ¿Por qué estás tan lejos y no vienes a salvarme? ¿Por qué no atiendes mi clamor? Dios mío, te llamo de día y no me respondes. Te llamo de noche y no hallo reposo. Tú eres santo, tú eres rey, tú eres alabado por Israel. Nuestros padres confiaron en ti, en ti confiaron. Y tú los libraste. A ti clamaron y fueron librados. En ti confiaron y no quedaron en vergüenza. The words of many psalms have sounded familiar to us in the past year. As they reflect an array of emotions that resonate with us these days. Words so human and so true. The Psalms have a way of reflecting back to us what we might be feeling when words escape us. And Psalm 22 is not the exception. Here, the psalmist in his pain, feeling abandoned, cries to God, my God, my God, why have you left me all alone? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my anguished groans shouting from a place of deep sadness and despair of raw emotions. This is a place we have experienced. Many of us as close as this past month, week, or even today. Two things come to mind when reading Psalm 22. First, 
Jesus utters the words of the first verse while on the cross. Knowing the story of the passion of Jesus, how could he not? How could Jesus not cry out to God? Jesus' cry carries the weight of the sins of the world, including yours and including mine, personified in those who betrayed and condemned him and those that had followed him but left him all alone in the moment of greatest need. Here we see Jesus fragile, vulnerable before God, shouting from a place of deep sadness and despair, suffering because of us, for us, but also suffering with us. To hear the words that are so human coming from Jesus, for some might be confusing. Jesus is, after all, God incarnate, God's son, our savior, our redeemer, our teacher. Yet, in his humanity, suffering and depleted, Jesus cries out to God, why have you forsaken me? Second, it is interesting to me that having alternated between cries of despair and remembrance of God's deliverance, the psalm takes a turn in its discourse, that proverbial light at the end of the tunnel moment. Beginning on verse 24, the song shifts from lament to trust, to hope, to praise. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. Although the psalmist felt abandoned by God, God did not leave him. God indeed heard and delivered him. Now here's what caught my attention as I read the psalm this time around. It does not say, how God delivered him exactly. What is it that God did that inspired words and acts of praise so powerful and heartfelt that all the earth's powerful will worship God and future descendants will proclaim God's righteousness? I don't have the answer per se, but I infer it might have been some kind of miracle, supernatural or otherwise a miracle in the form of literal salvation from a dangerous situation, or a miracle in the form of an aha moment of illumination, seeing something that wasn't seen before, a blessed coincidence, a random visit or happening that changed perspectives, an unexpected person that came to aid, much like the Samaritan man in Jesus's parable that moved to compassion became the miracle for the man that was left for dead. And this, quest this question, how did God deliver? How did God save? Led me to reflect on the times I have experienced this in myself and have seen it in others, such salvation, such miracles, especially in this past year. That illumination of the Holy Spirit to see something that was not seen before, that blessed coincidence that became an opportunity that random visit, Zoom conference, or virtual worship that changed someone's perspective or inspired acts of justice and kindness. That unexpected person or group of people that became a miracle to someone who desperately needed it. How did God deliver? Through miracles. And that miracle could very well be you and me becoming that for others. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These days we keep hearing these words from the psalmist uttered from the cross by Jesus. Again and again, versions, versions of the same cry in different languages and from distinct voices. With so many instances of hate and unkindness in our country and our world, we are in desperate need of people that can become someone's miracle. Many of us Christians have understood deliverance in the spiritual and personal sense, but we have forgotten its collective and day-to-day -day implications that demand response and action from us. Jesus, our savior, our redeemer, our teacher, shouting from the cross beckons us 
to listen to the cry of our siblings from their places of deep sadness and despair and to respond. Jesus is our miracle. May we be moved by his example of life, love, and ministry to carry our own crosses and follow him. So that when our siblings cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In any version, in any language, and in any voice, we may respond with a loud and clear, Emi aquí, I am here. God has not forsaken you. God has sent me. Así nos ayude Dios. Amen. Everything was already completed. In order to fill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. The fifth word in spoken word. I am thirsting. The Greek word is dipso. It's parsed present active indicative first person singular comparative. Not just thirsty, it's really thirsty. Not just thirsting once. It's thirsting even more than last time, more than the last time, more than in the garden. Let this cup pass from me, if it be possible, thirstier than that. Mother Teresa said missionaries of charity had in every one of their chapels a crucifix of Jesus with the words next to it, I thirst. Not bodily thirst, so says Mother Teresa, to quench the thirst of Jesus for souls, for love for kindness, for compassion, for delicate love. Jesus thirst for us, Jesus thirst for the world. Not hashtag thirst, not retweet thirst, not friend or like thirst, not selfies with thirst. Jesus thirst for love, for kindness, for compassion. He thirst for freedom, freedom for the children, hundreds of them in cages, thirsting for millions of of migrants to be granted asylum, thirsting for billions to receive vaccinations. I thirst, he thirst with millions, he thirst for millions. Picture it 2022, thirsting in voting lines. Georgia Senate Bill 202, no water for you, go thirsty. Yeah, you, wait there if you want to really vote, wait, go thirsty. So say the powers and principalities, Contraveners, contradictors, the intruders, the naysayers, the disenfranchisers, the injustice instigators, the water police, the thirst enforcers. You thirst for a vote? Then wait. You thirst for a choice? Then wait. You thirst for justice? Then wait. Wait there. Rot there. So say the anti-strangers, the anti-welcomers, the anti-dreamers, the nightmare givers, the ones who would have you wait. Jesus thirst. Give brother George Floyd water, damn it. Give him air. How do you expect him to breathe, to drink, to live? Or do you want him to, Mr. Powers, Madam Principality, Mr. Chauvin? Jesus thirst. Thirst with him. Stop the hate. Stop the shoving. Stop the kicking. Jesus thirst for all those who are alone, who are made to feel alone. 
wrapped and cramped, caged and covered in aluminum foil blankets, left to fend for themselves, little children, thirsty, hungry, yearning, panting for freedom for life. As a deer pants for water, so we long for thee, our God, our liberator, our freedom fighter. There's a thirst that is not on the lips nor in the mouth, thirsting, panting, longing, yearning, pleading, thirsting in the soul, thirsting deep down, way down. There's a thirsting because bad water has been given, salt water, brackish water, sour wine, like eating a bag of chips, binging on buffalo wings and downing a can of beer. Those won't quench the thirst. Bad justice won't either. Misguided, misinformed, it's a kind of justice that merely says thoughts and prayers. The moderate kind of justice that doesn't really do anything. It pretends to do something, but it's, but it's really nothing. It has a good talk, but it doesn't walk. It's a kind of justice that leaves you wanting, thirsty, and hungry that snoozes and loses, that goes weak and goes home, that gives in to filibusters, to threats of lockdowns. It's a kind of justice that postpones, that delays, that disregards, that denigrates, that sweeps, that shovels things under the rug, that hides a light under a bushel. It's a kind of justice that thinks it can shut up the voice of God, shut down the will of God, shut in the power of God. That's Pilate's justice. That's Caiaphas's justice. It shuts the door on 65-year-old Filipina Vilma Kari because it doesn't want to be bothered. It clothes some kids, but not all of them. It's a kind that thinks it makes a country stronger by wearing red hats with four letters and blazon. That thinks by stomping and screaming, vandalizing and vituperating, wrecking and wailing, insurrecting and invading, by putting a cross with a flag of a cause lost long ago that somehow such justice will prevail, such justice will quench the thirst. It only makes the thirst grow thirstier, the hunger grow hungrier, the hurt grow more hurtful, the tears drop by the buckets, the prayers cascade like pillars reaching the heavens. It's a kind of thirsty justice that easily says all lives matter or simply puts a hashtag in front of it but doesn't really care about Asian lives, Asian American Pacific Islander lives, Black lives, Indigenous lives, Latinx lives, GLBTQIA plus lives, Muslim lives. That's the kind of justice that's no justice at all. It just is, not justice. It leaves you thirsty because we're growing thirsty even more, more than last year, more than the year before that more than a decade before that one, more than a century before that one. Because all those so-called tries, all those so-called attempts, all those so-called promises, all those so-called efforts, all that water was brackish water. It left us thirsty, thirsting for freedom because so many were left to stay thirsty, to drink wells, Flint, Michigan wells, communities left to fend for themselves, communities left to rely upon the oppressors, the subjugators, the victimizers, the plantation owners, the employers, the traffickers. I thirst, thirsting even more because the thirst for justice, for righting the wrong, for repairing the brokenness were never quenched. We were given sour wine on a hyssop branch left forsaken, left forlorn, left forgotten. So that powers, principalities, the pilots, the pharaohs, the Caesars can enjoy their drink, their drunkenness, their food, their feasts, their foolishness, their profits, their parties, their putridities. Thirst with Jesus. Jesus thirst for us. Jesus thirst for the world. Let us drink from the living waters of the spirit who gives us life, who breathes life, who awakens our worn and weary bones, our torn and tired souls, and who calls us to thirst no more. I am here, he says. I am risen, he says. Come, let us quench the long thirst for justice, he says. I am the neighbor, he says. I am the stranger, he says. I am the least among you, he says. 
I am with you, he says. I am among you, he says. I am thirsting, he says. received the sour wine, Jesus said, it is completed. And bowing his head, he gave up his life. For Jesus and all those who followed him, it was already a horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day. For it started early in that morning when those who were in power had taken Jesus to Pilate to seek his death. Pilate was not understanding why this was happening and was questioning Jesus over and over again, not getting a satisfactory answer. And yet Pilate washed his hands of the situation and gave the people what they wanted, Barabbas in exchange for the death of Jesus, making Jesus put the crossbar on his back, walking through the city streets to the skull, the place Golgotha. Those who were looking at Jesus on the way, some of them were crying, saying, please don't take him away. Some were saying this was unjust. Some were saying good riddance. Those who were with Jesus, didn't know exactly what to do. The disciples had gone. The Roman soldiers had messed with him, telling him that you are not who you think you are. We find that for Jesus, it was very much a situation of loneliness, of pain, of trying to complete what God had for him, but yet it was very, very difficult. We find that even the authorities who had put him to death were arguing, going back to Pilate saying, can you change the name that you've put on him? Say that he's the king of Jews. Tell him, or just write on there saying that he says that I am the king of the Jews. But Pilate said, I wrote what I wrote. We find that even the soldiers at the bottom of the cross were casting lots for his clothing, saying, well, I'll take this and you take that and I don't want this and he's a dead man anyway, don't matter. The only people who were there who loved him and cared for him was his mother and a few other women along with the disciple that he loved. And Jesus finally given over himself saying, woman, this is your son and son, this is your mother. All those who had loved Jesus, who had known him had left. And Jesus, as he is there on the cross, suffering, his body breaking down, his muscles coming apart from his sinews, starting to suffocate him suffering also from dehydration on the cross, pain 
that is going on. Those who were in on, other, on each side of him saying, what are you doing up here? And yet, as he was thirsty, they put up some sour wine, some wine vinegar to him, wanting him to drink when he said, I thirst. With nothing else left to do, he said, it is finished. It is completed. And gave up his last breath. It is finished, is it not? For yet, although it's going to reveal a little bit later on in a few days, we who have read the text and understand that this is the seminal point of Jesus dying for us, maybe for forgiving our sins, or maybe that we will come together, maybe as a people, no matter who we are, for Jesus loved everyone. But we have to ask ourselves a question. Is it really finished? Is it finished when we still have children at the border separated from their parents and we see the conditions that are happening? Is it finished when we still have African-Americans and other people of color still killed and have to go to court for justice? And let me tell you, there are some people who think justice is even gonna happen even in this Derek Chauvin trial. Is it really finished? the work of Jesus on this earth, when we still find out there's inequities even in the distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine between communities of color and those of the majority. Do we still find out or do we still believe that it's finished when we still have what's going on in Atlanta? Six Asian women killed in three different establishments. And even, not only from the last administration, but even as long as we've been here in America, Asian Americans, African Americans, Native Americans, others have still been going through these difficulties. Is it really finished when we're still trying to fight for gender justice and, and justice for those who are transgender? Is it really over when we still have the same systems that this country and this world was built upon still oppressing others? Is it really finished for even those of us who are serving churches? Or I should say now, those of you who are serving churches, when you're still trying to fight and understand how to worship, even when some people have been vaccinated, and let's forget about the rest. Is it really finished, as Jesus said? We may say and may believe in the words of Jesus when Jesus says it is finished. But I can tell you this, it ain't over. Chapter 23, verses 44 through 46. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, 
Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So friends, some weeks ago, I injured my hand and had to have it surgically repaired. And now as I am in the process of getting whole again and, and helping this hand work the way it used to, uh, the song that we learned as children comes to mind. He's got the whole world in his hands. Um, I'm really wrestling right now with the value and the importance of our hands. And one person whom I'm pretty sure learned that song like so many of us did was Addie Mae Collins. For some of you, that name might ring a bell. She was a neighbor, she was a native, excuse me, of Birmingham, Alabama, the daughter of Julius, Julius and Alice Collins. And this month will mark Addie Mae Collins's 72nd birthday. Except unfortunately, she won't be here to celebrate it she never even made it to her 70th birthday. In fact, she never even made it to her 17th birthday. Addie Mae Collins died at just 14 years old. She and three of her friends were attending church school at 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, maybe even singing that song at some point on September 15th, 1963, when a bomb planted by the KKK exploded. Annie Mae Collins and three of her friends, the youngest of whom was 11 years old, were, were killed. And their deaths sparked tense demonstrations and put the spotlight on the fight for civil rights in the American South. So this month, she should be lavished with gifts and balloons and cards and celebrating with family. Maybe even that family would have included some kids and grandkids. But instead, she rests in Greenwood Cemetery in Birmingham. And the epitaph on her headstone reads, she died so that freedom might live. Somehow that just does not seem fair to me. On this Good Friday, there may be some temptation to skip to the rolled away stone and risen Jesus of Easter, especially after the year that we have had. But I implore you, don't do that. Stay here for a moment. Stay here in this liminal space where nothing is right because some things just are not fair. And we don't have to pretend that they are. It's not fair that Addie Mae Collins and her friends didn't get to live to old age. It's not fair that neither did, did, did those who died in the shooting at Mother Emanuel. It's not fair that eight people were killed in Georgia recently, six of whom were women of Asian descent in an attack that is clearly a hate crime to everybody except the law. It's not fair that of all our pre-COVID realities, back to normal for the United States includes mass shootings that barely may make a blip on the news cycle. It's not fair. It's not fair that children still languish in, in, in cages at the border. It's not fair. It's not fair that treaties with indigenous peoples are routinely broken because their lands uh, are rich in resources that we want. It's not fair. It's not fair that evil can keep winning over and over again. There's nothing fair about this day, about Jesus hanging on the cross. His blood should have been enough. There's nothing fair about the conspiracy and the betrayal and state-sponsored violence that brought him there. It wasn't fair. But even as he hung there, in all that unfairness, blood filling his lungs, he still manages to muster the last bit of agency that he can. He says, Father, into your hands. I commend my spirit. And in that moment, he is reclaiming control of the situation. I looked at the text and I looked at the Greek text specifically and what the Greek word for hands is, it is in this case. And it is the word keros, which means so much more than just hands, friends. It means agency. It means authority, power, might. I give my spirit, my pneuma, 
my breath over to your power, God, to your might, to your authority. You take control. The same breath that God breathed into his ancestor, Adam, that breath that belongs to his father in the first place, he gave it back to him. He didn't give up. He gave it over. In that moment, Jesus was saying, I know this is a liminal space and it's not entirely clear how this is going to turn out, but I'm not looking for victory over the moment because I know you, God, have victory over the eternal eternity. So friends, on this Good Friday, we can take our cues from Jesus in the face of so much injustice, giving what little we have left to God because God's hands... God's power are the only ones capable of doing anything with it. So friends know that it's not fair, but you know what else? It's also not over. God's got the whole world in God's hands. Amen. A reading from Luke. who have brought the word today and for their service and for the commitment to Jesus Christ as is lived out in the embodiment of our denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA. Grateful for you, my friends. I invite you now to simply close your eyes, to sit and be grounded, and I'll ring seven chimes for the seven last words, and then we will leave in peace. <laughs> 